We wanted to say thank you for uh, the visits, the calls. It's most encouraging to uh, Sister Janice. Um, we've got a couple that are gone. Um, I see Dennis is not here with us today. We're we're missing him. I put a, I sent a note to him to in in you know hopefully that will encourage him. Kenny's pain levels are up, so he's not here today. Uh, Donna is at home recovering from her knee surgery. She may have done a little bit more than what she should have uh, yesterday, but uh, they do enjoy their time out at the fort volunteering there. And then. Um, Aaron Brensel, we need to keep him in prayer because his surgery uh, is coming up Wednesday, I believe it is. Yeah, the, Wednesday's the 8th, right? Yeah, so, so we want to be mindful of him as well. We're, as you can see on the board, this, the, the title of our lesson in our current series this, uh, this morning, we're continuing our study Um, of the greatest command that Scripture uh, records for us, uh, and that is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This command is found in three of the Gospels, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, and uh, uh, in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 10. So what we're doing today is, is... it's going to follow closely on the heels of our last uh, lesson uh, because last Sunday we, we, we kind of answered the question about our actions involved in our heart. You know, is our heart diseased? Is our heart tired? You know, sometimes we can have problems with our heart that need to be mended. Uh, uh, is our heart really tired if looking at Jesus' example... He was sustained by doing God's will, you know. So um, we we see from that that our um, the the expectation that God has for us uh, is to be active. We need to be active in loving God. You know, we've been told throughout Scripture numerous times to love God, and so. How do we translate this to something that is more tangible? How do we, how do we let our, uh, our love of God be something that He recognizes? You know, Jesus, what did Jesus say, uh, his, his new commandment, according to John? A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And what did He say there? By this, and I'm going to add something here, by this kind of love, okay, by this love, all men will know that you are my disciples. And, and the only way that we can make that kind of love evident is if it is a kind of love that God says we should be practicing. There was a post online a few days ago, you know, and and it was one of these uh, worldly wisdom kind of nice things to hear, you know, and it was saying that we need to be, you know, uh, more loving. But but I, I was hoping that in my statement, in my response to that, that I made it clear man's idea of love is not always God's idea of love, right? And so we need to make sure that if we're going to love, that we practice the definition of love that God and God alone provide, because that's the only kind of love that uh, is, is, uh, is going to be expressive of what Jesus says in John chapter 13. So <clears throat> to believe um, God would allow a person to accept His saving grace without reciprocating any kind of thanksgiving for that salvation, that is, I believe, antithetical to the entire conversation. In other words, if we're going to love, we, we have to be expressive in that love. If we're not going to do that, then why bother calling ourselves a Christian? Because that is definitely not Christ-like. Okay? We must never consider that love can be something that is only passive. Love demands 
responsive actions. And so, how then does our heart affect the loving of God? First <clears throat> um, John four eight. You can see, you know, the passage uh, up there. Um, the second part of God's command is kind of what we're focusing on here because the greatest command is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's the second part of that command? You shall love others as yourself. So why would we do, why would we do this? You know, there, there's basically three reasons for this. And I'm going to open my Bible, Bible here and read these passages here. Uh, that I have for us because it's important for us to understand where this stuff comes from. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 39, the first thing we understand here as to why we need to do this is because God commands it. In Matthew 22, verse 39, it says here, the second is like it. The second what? The second part of the greatest command. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, Christ demands this as well. Look at Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He'll sit on His glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He'll put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why does he say this? For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And notice what he says here. When uh, the king says in verse 40, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. So what we find here is that Jesus is saying the way that we fulfill this loving of God from this aspect is that we show that we love God because we love others. The apostles ordered this as well. That's the third reason. God said do it. Jesus said do it. And because we follow apostolic teaching, they're saying the same thing. Look at what James says in chapter 2. Uh, verses 15 through 17. It says here, If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, yet you don't give them what's necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, it is dead being by itself. And so it's important for us to understand those things. So we're going to be looking at a, uh, one passage in particular as we talk about uh, this subject today, and that's Matthew chapter uh, 7. If you want to turn your Bibles there, I'm going to read verses 15 through 20. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. This is our text for today. <clears throat> It has within it all the concepts for fruit production. Listen to what he says here. Beware the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you'll know them by their fruits. This section, <clears throat> this section of Scripture is a part of Jesus' first sermon. Uh, one of the points referencing uh, born fruit relates to the teaching we receive. Again, 
Jesus is saying in this passage, in a nutshell, we can only produce the kind of fruit that God wants us to produce if our understanding of God is what it's supposed to be. Okay? The truths found in this section then are going to apply to all the behaviors that we might find ourselves in as a result of the spiritual teachings we either choose to follow or deny. And I mention that specifically because how many different religions are there? I mean, seriously. There's a ton of them. Which is against what Jesus said to Peter in Matthew chapter 16. Because in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says, I will build my church. Not, I will build my churches. There's only one. If we are listening to spiritual instruction that is not founded in Scripture, we're not going to bear the kind of fruit that God wants us to bear. It's just not going to happen. It can't happen. It begins with desire. Bearing good fruit. We, it's, you, you know, everything that we do has a reason, right? Why do you... <laughs> So my doc is telling me that there's some foods I don't need to be eating anymore. You can't tell a German not to eat sausage. That's just wrong. I, you know, I, I, I love that stuff. But because of certain health things, you know, he's saying it's really not wise to eat that kind of stuff anymore. That's not the only thing. I should not be eating another favorite, and that is donuts. I love donuts. People know that mailmen like donuts because yesterday when I got to work, the local and I'm not kidding. When I tell you the local donuts are better than those you can find in a lot of places in, in the big city there, I, I, it's, it's, just, it's just a fact. And so they had a dozen and a half of those morsels in the break room. I sat down with those things about two feet from me, and I ate my blueberry yogurt. I did very good. But at the end of the day, you know what I was thinking? I got back from my route and I'm thinking, I'm going to go and get me a donut. I worked hard. I earned it. Went in there. There weren't any. Okay, Lord, thank you. Thank you for protecting me from what I should not be eating anyway. Point is, we eat because we're hungry, right? Um, we drink... Uh, because we're thirsty, we're parched, you know, and so we got to get that, you know, when I sat down at the uh, beginning of Bible class, Steve had a ice-cold bottle of water here, and I'm thinking, boy, that really looks good. You could see the condensation forming on it, you know, and, and most refreshing. You know, so we do that. Why? You get my point, right? You get my point. But that's what the passage is telling us here in Matthew chapter 7. You know, he, he says, uh, uh, I mean, in the second part of that command, because it tells us there, love others, what's, what is the, the stipulation? How do, we, how do we measure that? We love others as you would have them love you, Right? Well, we want that, so if I want that, why not give that? That's what he's telling us. In the first part of this uh, passage in Matthew chapter 7, 
There is a Greek term here. It is pseudoprophetes. It is the Greek word. It's, it, it's, there's two words here, pseudo and prophetes. Uh, prophet, prophetes is obviously the word where we get our term prophet, right? Pseudo, it means not real. It's, it's an image of, but it's not the real thing. A false prophet. It's somebody who looks like a prophet. It's somebody who may act like a prophet, but is not somebody who is teaching the things that God's prophets ought to be teaching. That's why he says it's a pseudo prophetess. I want to apply this in a different way here. Is it possible to be a false Christian? And the answer is an absolute yes. Absolutely. People can say they're a Christian. People can uh, people can say a lot of things. But if their words aren't matching what what their behaviors ought to be or their practices, it's not going to be the same thing. It is a false Christian. Um, there's no way that we can love God in the way that we ought to love God if we are not putting that into practice. And so, <clears throat> inwardly, there is a... Uh, the adverb of place meaning within, you know, within. Here's the question. How can anyone hide things from God when it was He who made the inward parts, right? It's just, it's impossible there. Beware the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. How can... Inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. What this means is, is this person puts on a front. You know that? They, they, they put on a front. And, and they look one way. They may behave one way. Uh, there was an old cartoon when, when I was growing up. Uh, and uh, it was Coyote and, not the Coyote and Red Runner, but this was the uh, that, that sheep dog, and he would guard the sheep, and he'd overlook, and they'd have the time card and punch in. Some of you younger folks are going to have to Google this. You know. Anyway, that Ralph and George, yeah, George was the wolf, and he would put on a sheep outfit, right? He would wear and he kind of he would look like a sheep, but what was he doing? He was sneaking down there, hanging out amongst the flock in hopes to steal one for dinner. The how do you how do you discover if 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 somebody is false or not. How do you do that? Well, Scripture, scripture has that for us because there is a depiction. In verse 16, notice what he says here. You'll know them by their fruits. And then he goes on to describe it. You don't gather grapes from a fig tree. You don't get figs from thistles. It, it's just, that's just the way of agriculture. It just, it just works that way. Um, the, the evidence here is then illustrated. James has some things to say about this too in chapter 3 beginning in verse 5. So also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great things. Behold how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. The tongue is a fire the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. 
For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brother, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Neither can salt water produce fresh. And so they, they illustrate quite well that the character of a person is going to be revealed one way or another. It, it's, it's just going to happen. This is, further, <clears throat> this is further illustrated in the next part of our passage in Matthew chapter 7. Uh, verses 17 and uh, 18. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. He says the same thing two different ways, and we're going to talk about that, but evidence does not betray its origin. You know that? Evidence does not betray its origin. This passage seems to be redundant here, but there is a message that Jesus is trying to get across here. Can a person go to school studying business management with a minor in marketing and then graduate as an aerospace engineer? No. It's just not going to happen. Neither can one who claims belief in God produce good fruit if their claim is insincere. If a person's confession to God is true, this same person can only produce that which is good. Kind of, you know, it, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? <clears throat> Bearing good fruit is the next thing. So what do, what do we do with fruit that's gone bad? That's, you know, I, you know, I got this picture from a photographer who only takes pictures of rotting stuff in an attempt to look for the beauty within. But behind there, there's some peaches and apples and pears and who's going to dive into that? Certainly not me. I'm allergic to penicillin. That could kill me. What do you do with things that don't function as they were designed? My wife had a car years ago. It was a Volvo. I think it was red, she said. And, and I think I told you all about this once before, you know, but this car had some problems. Uh, wipers didn't work right, and it was just, you know, and y'all just left that side of the side, the side of the road one time, I think. Cops called, what do you want us to do? We don't want it. You know, it's, yeah. It just didn't work the way it was supposed to work. You get rid of it. Um, <clears throat> There is a fire that is talked about in here. In verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You know, and so this, this fire is a place that is reserved for those who are spiritually lacking. That's who it's for. You know, the faithful don't have to worry about it. You know, but Scripture definitely tells us it's there. And so it's something that we have to teach. It's something that we have to be understanding of. It's something that we have to know. And some time in conversations that you have with somebody else, you may have to share this with them. It is a stark reality. If a person is not what God wants them to be faithfully, uh, it's not going to be good for them. If a person is lacking in the salvation of Christ, if a person is lacking in the desire to be fruitful after accepting salvation, 
you know, it, it, it doesn't go well for them. James chapter 2, verse 17, again, if faith, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. They can't work together. Um, so, bearing good fruit, this leads us to all kind of possibilities. I got a whole list of them here, and you'll notice down at the bottom of the slide there that there's more that can be added uh, because there's all kinds of ministries. And I've mentioned it before. You know, we're a small congregation. Uh, we, we have a few ministries that we're involved in, but if somebody comes in here and says, hey, you know, why would it be okay if I did A, B, or C? If A, B, or C doesn't violate the will of God, I'm all for it. Yes, do A, B, or C, right? You know, repentance is, is, a, is an item that we've got to have on the list here because it, in, it involves God's example of regret and action. You know that? Because in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, it is a, uh, it's, it's a sad situation, you know, but it says there that God repented that he made man. And, and, and why is that? You know, because they became so evil, so evil, there was no more redeeming value in humanity except for a handful of people. You know, Noah, his wife, his family. That was it. Eight souls saved by water, Peter tells us. Um, there is a uh, song. It's not in... Uh, I think it's... We have a newer songbook in here. Um, if you get a chance, uh, look this up on YouTube. It, it is a simple song. I hope sometime uh, that when we do our singings together that we can... Uh, learn this song together, but it is a uh, African American spiritual that was born out of uh, the years of slavery, and it became popular to the point that it was added to our hymn books. And it's, it's been around a long time, um, but it, the, the title of this song is "Lord, I Want to Be a Christian." You know, it starts out kind of slow and chorus, it goes a little bit quicker. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Because that's, that's what we're talking about here. You know, and, and that's the direction we go. Because the direction that we go for God, toward God, Lord, I want to be a Christian, that's the direction we're headed. It is opposite the direction where we've been. God doesn't want us back there. Why doesn't He want us back there? Because we know what Genesis chapter 6, verse 6 says. People who are not willing to give their life to God are going to meet a bad end. we got to repent. And that's a huge possibility, and that's where it all begins. There is uh, uh, maybe Bible reading. Uh, maybe you've heard of William McPherson. William McPherson, um, he's blind uh, and he is paralyzed. The only way that he is able to read the Bible is with his tongue. He learned how to read Braille and do so with his tongue. That is, that is huge. That is amazing. It shows a great desire for somebody who wants to know God and knows where to find God, and that's where God is found. It's in His, it, it's in his Word, and so He reads with His tongue. Forgiveness is another uh, fruit that is good to bear because we need to, as much as we need it, Others need it as well. I know I need God's forgiveness. I know that I have no hope without God's forgiveness. I want God's forgiveness. I ask Him for forgiveness. And so when somebody does something wrong against me, 
are they not equally deserving of forgiveness from me? What words whispered in the ear are considered to me those of beauty? List a bunch of things, but make sure that you include, I forgive you. That's a, that's a good one. How about compassion? You know, um, I have a, a little story here. I've got to read because I, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, Y'all know the name Nathaniel Hawthorne, American author? He would not have been an American author had it not been for a compassionate display by his wife. Do you know that? One, one winter day, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, he went home with a heavy heart. And the reason for this is because he had just lost his job, government appointment. Um, you know, and when, when you lose uh, a job, a good job, I mean, I've known people that have worked their whole life in a job and just a few years before retirement, they're laid off. It's a, it's a sad situation. That's where Nathaniel Hawthorne found himself. Well, he cast himself down as men generally do under such circumstances and assumed the very attitude of despondency. His wife soon discovered the cause of his distress. However, instead of indulging in irrational hysterics, oh, what are we going to do? How are we going to make ends meet? Uh, she didn't do that. She went to the other room, she grabbed a pen, she grabbed ink, and she grabbed paper. She brought it back to the table where he was sitting and set it before him, and she put her hand on his shoulder, and she said, now you can write your book. That's when the course of his life dramatically changed because he wrote a novel, he wrote a number of things, uh, he was able to put bread back on the table, uh, lots of loaves, I guess, um, and we know his name. A lot of us know his name to this day, all because somebody was compassionate. There is uh, unselfishness. <clears throat> Ever hear the story of Jake Porter? Jake Porter had chromosomal fragile X syndrome. Um, if a person has this, their, their, their mental state is retarded. It's not, uh, it's not to the level of other people of the same age. Okay? Well, he, he loved football, and he was faithful to practice all the time at high school. Never missed a game. Um, well, there was a game coming up, and the coach for Northwest High, that's where <clears throat> Jake went to school, called a friend at Waverly High. Dave France was the coach of Northwest. Derek DeWitt was the coach of Waverly High. They're both of McDermott, Ohio, but they made a deal. And so here, here's what they were going to do. They were going to allow Jake to take the ball at the game's end and then let him take a knee. He would go in the record books as having played a game, okay? Um, well, <clears throat> Rick Riley, he was a sports uh, illustrated reporter. He, he, he's talking about this, and he says at, at, at a point in the game, you know, <clears throat> Waverly High is just whooping Northwest High. They're 40, it's 42 to nothing, okay, at this point in the game. And so the coaches, they meet, uh, center of the field, and they vi have this visible disagreement. Everybody knows that the conversation didn't go you know, the way that the other was wanting the conversation to go. And, and, and so anyway, uh, the next play, the ball is hiked. It's given to Jake, who runs the wrong way, okay? Well, he's encouraged by the referees to run the right way. He's further encouraged by his teammates, and then all the fans join in, and, and all the players, both offense and defense, okay? And then it says here, as Jake 
uh, I mean, as Rick Riley reported it, he said that uh, the defensive line parted like peasants for the king, and they themselves, I get kind of emotional when you think about this kind of thing, but anyway, they parted uh, and cheered Jake on as he sprinted toward the goal. What's amazing about this particular story, and we're talking about all the possibilities that exist within our heart, unselfishness is absolutely awesome. Because in this picture, you have, basically, football is a battle. You have two teams, and, and, and they have goals to meet. And the other team is an enemy who is, whose sole reason on that field is to keep them from meeting those goals. But when you have one team who says, go ahead. You can have what it is I'm supposed to protect. Uh, it, it's, it's a great story. I think it's a great story. Then you have service. Uh, there's a poem titled Helping Others. I, I don't know who wrote it, but it says, If you show kindness to someone, I'm sure that you will find not only they are happy, but you'll have peace of mind. It's kind of strange it works that way, but sure enough, it will. For a while you're helping, for while you're helping other folks, the Lord your cup will fill. That's, I think those kinds of things are neat, you know, but, and there's so much more. But the result, bearing good fruit, really ultimately means being gathered into his barn and this is an idea that's shared in Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, Matthew 13, 30, and Luke 3, 17. <clears throat> the concepts that we've talked, out, talked about today, they really need to be understood and developed in, in order pr to produce the good fruit that God wants. There has to be that desire we have to be able to de depict what good fruit is so that others are able to uh, witness it. And that's not always going to happen. We talk, what's the definition of character that we learned about in Bible school, uh, Bible class today? The, def the, the best definition of a character is who you are when no one else is looking. Right? You know, so others may not see the good that you do, but, but the point is... God always does. And He, he encourages us on, uh, encourage us on in those acts of good service. So as I challenge you in the coming days, as you read your Bible, to notice how often Scripture records people doing for others, for God. Because Christian, Christianity is not nor has it ever been something that, uh, uh, that can be described as a passive religion. Amen? I don't know what your needs are today. If there's any way that we can help you, any way that we can bless you, any way that we can encourage you, uh, if you want to know more about what it means to be a child of God, how to get from point A to point B. What is point A? Point A is being unsaved. Point B is being saved. We... We have to be in a saved state uh, before we leave this earth because Hebrews 9.27, it tells us there, uh, there is an appointed time for men to die once and then the judgment. And so we need to make sure that we've got things in order before we die. So if there's any way that we can encourage you today, let us know while we stand and sing. The voice of the Savior says, come.